So how many of you would consider yourself, you know, in Solidity and Smart Contracts, like, you know, you, you're starting with it. You're, you're, you're not, you know, it's the first time to it. You're just getting started. You have coded a few things, but, you know, you're still pretty new. Okay, so I would figure that everybody else considers themselves to be intermediate or advanced level of security. All right. So I don't know how much of what I'm going to say you perhaps have already, uh, you already know about it. So we could have more of a dialogue. And you could and, and you could have um, we're gonna have room at the at the end of the session for some questions. That's for uh, mostly also why Gonzalo from Diligence is here because uh, they work on security on their everyday basis. So if there's a question that I'm not able to address, he'll for sure be able to or at least help me figure it out a way to solve it. <laughs> so how many uh, uh, so how many of you are from our have taken any? class or anything in, in, in uh, for, for Ethereum or how many of you take courses or do you teach yourself? How many of you take courses? <coughs> how many of you learn yourself? Do you, most of you. Alright, that's good. Alright. How many of you learn like uh, from GitHub or repos from people? That's that's mostly where people learn it from? Yeah? If not, where, where do you usually, if you want to learn about uh, Ethereum, where do you go to? I'm sorry? Read the docs. You read the specs, the docs, yes. Stuggle yeah. Stuggle yeah. That's a common one. <laughs> Alright. <laughs> and just out of curiosity, because we're always about how many people here is consensus? Yeah, we're always we're always there. <laughs> Alright. So let's see if we can get started because honestly the, the the room is full, so Actually, that will give us a little bit more time of um, yeah, to work on this. So, considering that most of the audience is advanced or intermediate, I'll try to go maybe a little bit fast about uh, about some of the topics. Also, I don't know how well some of the code will be re will be able to be written on the back. So we'll see how that goes. So we have more time for questions and answers or like concerns about how to address for focus security and maybe Gonzalo can tell you a little bit more about you know how audits are conducted uh, for smart contracts. Alright? So let me go back to first of all, welcome. So I'll introduce myself and I'll let Gonzalo introduce himself. So my name is Carlos. Um, I got involved in the blockchain space in, in, in 2014, <coughs> late 2014. I had my startup at that time and basically I was just you know, trying to, I was just using Bitcoin blockchain to stamp documents because my startup were having a lot of documentation and using DocuSign didn't seem like something a startup would do. Uh, so I, and, and I started with it, but to be honest, I didn't really got, um, like it didn't excite me that much. Uh, then, but I ran into Ethereum and that for me was really, a, 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 it blew my mind. And it made me get into the space. And little by little, I've been doing things in the space until I uh, I joined Consensus. I think about year and almost two years, perhaps. And uh, I work in the educational arm. Um, I'll, I'll I'll tell you a little bit more about it later. But uh, also in this session, um, I want to introduce you to Gonzalo. Yeah, I can. Hey guys, I can introduce myself real quickly. Uh, we've been, I'm part of the diligence team at Consensus, we mostly do uh, security audits, but we also, do, we also build security tools, uh, mostly uh, automated analysis tools uh, that will uh, report back to any flaws that your code might have. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know that, um, that uh, my story of getting into here is exciting enough to tell right now, but yeah, I've been doing, I've been hacking for most of my life and I found Ethereum. Uh, a while ago, um, late 2016, and I have been uh, breaking smart contracts ever since. And yeah, I'm here to uh, answer any questions that you might have in the end or throughout the session. Uh, feel free to stop, Carlos, I guess. Yeah. And yeah, if you if you have any uh, any smart contract that needs auditing, please come to me and we can we can get you hooked up. Sure. So, as probably everyone here knows, the consensus. Uh, you know, we. We're pretty broad and we do a lot of different things, but without that, in, in that there's also the educational arm, that's Consensus Academy, and basically on one side we try to get developers skilled uh, and, and ready to be able to build using Ethereum technology, 
and we're also trying to get uh, business leaders, managers, and you know lawyers and all the non-technical people to understand the technology enough to identify business opportunities. Uh, it is as important as that we have really strong developers community that we also have traction in the business and that the companies understand how to use it because probably not necessarily your cases, but if you're in the education in the blockchain education space and for whatever reason you work with enterprises, 90% of the ideas you hear that they want to use blockchain for is honestly not a good use case. So it's very important that they understand when this technology is relevant and what is it good for. And I think it's part of our commitment and our value to the ecosystem also to help that happen. And, that, and a little bit that's what we try to do in Academy. Uh, since everybody here is kind of a, a intermediate level, I'm just going to say that, well, we have trainings online, like Centrals, uh developers, actually it's a cohort that uh, it's going to start on the October 30th. Uh, we have this code. But if you're also looking to get into the space, like looking for a job, you might be interested in certifications. Those are certifications that are issued by consensus. There's smart contract developer, SCDC, and Ethereum developer basically is smart contract and dApps. Uh, smart contract developer is just smart contracts. And EVP is Ethereum business professional. In case you're interested or anything where you're looking for a job, those could be things that you might be interested in. Um, and also, like I've said, uh, we have here Gonzalo from, uh, from Diligence. And Diligence, uh, basically what they help you with, and correct me if, if I explain it wrong, Gonzalo, please, is uh, they help developers, startups, companies, and basically anyone who has a smart contract to you know, feel safer when they are in the mainnet that you know, they will not make the news because somebody hacked them. I guess uh, that's one way to put it. Um, and luckily in, this, in consensus there's you know, the people that have really looked into this and, and, and I would say that probably one of the bright, some of the brightest minds in, in this aspect is, is in this team. So you know you could feel very confident to approach them if you have anything with regard to security. All right. So we're gonna go a little bit uh, about some code recommendations. We're gonna talk a little bit about some of the common attacks that uh, you might run into, and some of simple ways, or a little bit of simple ways to add, to to address it. And I guess most of you have have made a if you know if you're curious, you have already made it, especially if you're you know familiar with this. But we're gonna see how the attack of the DAO happened, and so you could understand how it run, and we're gonna run the code, so you could kind of see uh, what actually, uh, what, what is the problem or what happened there, as one of the most renowned uh, attacks that happened in the space. So as, as, as um, this, this, this get going, otherwise, you know, I'll bore you to death. Um, <coughs> as, basically, when you're, something important that you understand is that every, the smart contract at the end is code, and it is, it is compiled to bytecode, which is what the Ethereum virtual machine understands and runs. And ideally, we're trying to make that code as secure as possible. And if you really, really want to get into the, to the security level understanding, honestly, some people are actually, especially for gas optimization, they actually work, work at the bytecode level. So they understand the bytecodes, and they actually, at the end, they work with the bytecode. So if you're really into this, eventually, the next step or the next frontier for you is to actually be able to get to understand what's happening at the bytecode level and actually try to optimize there. For security, not necessarily is the, 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 the only thing or the most important thing, but it is important that uh, for gas that you consider because sometimes there's uh, at that level, like even just like rearranging things on the smart contract to help you. Um, so the important thing that I want to, to, to get started for the people that are new is that um, at the end, a contract in Ethereum is, is just another account. That, the, that it's, it's created by a transaction and basically the code is stored there. So as there's two types of accounts. You have the externally owned, the base, basically is managed by the private key that as a user you hold. And basically you are the one who holds to make the decisions. However, the contract accounts are governed and ruled by the code. So they only will do what the code says. That's it, that's why you cannot change, you cannot uh, you can trust a code that it's there because you know that you will only do what it says it does. And you could also trust this, the fact, it has its ups and downs, that, um, that no one can change it. Uh, one funny story, oh, not funny story, but one of the things when we're like, working with uh, the people who are training them 
and how to to get their first uh, smart contracts, everybody, or not everybody, most of everybody, uh, most of the students forget to get the function to get the money out of the contract. You would not, you would, you would, you don't believe how many people forget that because everyone's used to that the money just ends in the bank. You know, they don't, they, they, that's the mindset of changing the mindset of how this works is actually more challenging than people expect. So you have no idea how many contracts are out there that have ether locked because somebody forgot to, have, to make the function to get the money out. Right, so it's important that, and, and we'll see that when you actually uh, try to run here the fail fast, which is kind of a, something we heard a lot with web development and, and agile and everything, not necessarily is the approach for a smart contract. It's actually, a, I don't know, the opposite, but it's important that you are careful what you do and what you don't do. So everything just from the point of view of execution is, you know, the code is just taken by the IBM from the state, from the account, the input data comes in a transaction, all that is run based on whatever the function uh, says, and then at the end of the state, the account, the, uh, either the storage or, or whatever information that is there, it's next updated. You know, that's, that's the logic of it. And the important thing is that if something goes wrong, you know, then you know that the state is reverted. And that's important because we're gonna see one of the attacks where basically that's what you've enforced to happen so that the whatever function you're trying to run never ends or never gets to the finalization period point. So it's always reverted and then you kind of have a denial of service kind of a thing. As you know, from those of you, just for the, for the new people, there's a smart contract has uh, different spaces or different scope for variables and what we use, what we do with them and how do we use them, but also where we store them. And um, the, the, the point of view, of, from the point of view of the, <coughs> the space on storage, everybody knows that that's very expensive on the mainnet. You know, you need to optimize as much as you can for that. So there, there's like the temporary memory that's the memory in the stack that basically you can have variables that you will only be using while your code is running. But then they will not be there, they will not be stored, they will not be saved. And there, of course, whatever you need important, which is state variables, should be, unless you allocate memory to it, should be on the, on the, on the permanent memory of this, uh, uh, so that it's stored there and you don't lose that information. Uh, probably the only cases where you want to have something that is usually memory you want to store is if you have a very big array. And you, you know you, don't, you cannot loop through it infinitely because you have the gas limitation. So you may want to store the last position of the array so the next time you run it, you don't start from zero because otherwise you'll never loop through the entire array. So those are kind of things that you may want to think about uh, when you're coding. And that information that you're gonna need it for the whatever next call you make to that contract should be in the storage or in the permanent memory. Otherwise, uh, you know, you'll, for example, in the case of the array, you'll never loop through the entire array because you will start from when you initiate, in, initialize it in one and it will just go until you run out of gas. So it's very important to, to take those into account. And as you know, um, Ethereum has a balance model, not as a UTXL as Bitcoin. So basically, you know, you, it's much simpler for a lot of different things and, and getting like your balance and everything, it's, it's a simpler process. It's just basically a field, a data field in, in, in the structure, rather than a compilation of all the Bitcoin addresses and everything and adding them up and all that. So it's very simple to use and, and, and simplifies a lot of things. However, you know, it does not allow serialization, like a lot of transactions in parallel like the UTX model does. Now, so it has its, both, its, its pros and cons. But uh, so basically that's why it's important that, you know, if you need transactions, you, you have to make sure that the previous transaction has finished to get it started. Otherwise, uh, you know, you're not gonna have it. You're just not gonna have it. All right, so that's a little bit of, a, of the quick intro that I just wanted to, to make sure that we got some basic concepts uh, out there. So, as I was saying, um, it's very important that you have to understand that the code here, like in, in this environment, there's a high cost of failure. And not only from the point of view of security, which we all know, but for everything. If for whatever reason, you know, you need to update or change the code of the smart contract. If you have not really thought about the, how you're gonna migrate data or how you're gonna manage the data from the beginning, it, is a, it, it could be a very big pain to make that change. So 
thinking about, it's, it's, it's very hard sometimes when you're thinking about what your smart contract will do, because sometimes you don't even know where things are going to evolve, how you actually, what all you're going to need in the future. So it's very important that you are really, really take, a time, take your time to think what your smart contract might be doing, and also maybe if you want to start small and then growing. Because uh, if not, you know, you may run into some problem and the, the change could, you, could make, uh, make you get into a lot of trouble or like even into like issues with potential users that you have because you have to stop or something. The fact that they're immutable is good because we have trust and, and you have that, but it also implies a challenge that uh, you cannot, you know, oh, I'll just try this. If it doesn't work, I'll just fix it. Or, you know, like I'll just try to fix this as, 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 as in runtime, but no, that's not possible. And the important thing that I was saying, you fail fast is not the approach. And you need to think very carefully how, how you're going to address this. Then, um, I guess this is why we have, of course, services and everything. Bugs are in inevitable, inevitable. And, um, and they're always, and they might be there. I mean, I always say, like, you know, if the, the doubt thing happened, you know, anyone could make a mistake. Um, so it's very important that you, you are aware of this and you're not afraid to, 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 uh, um, to be open to testing it with others, to have it there, use you know, external party services to audit your code, for example, like for example, diligence or anything, to run tools that you have there. Formal verification, you know, it's still happening. Uh, uh, you know, some people, there's new tools. Uh, how is it, Ellie? I think it's a new tool for formal verification out there. There, there are a few other tools out there that are coming. Still is an ongoing thing, like everything in the space. <coughs> yes. Uh, you finish a bit. Uh, do you have any, any, do you have any sort of uh, thoughts on Manticore for like uh, testing, run, and auditing and uh, verification? I, I have like uh, you should use diligence as tools <laughs> instead of drill bits. Uh, um, we, we have the equivalent of Manticore and the Quibna. Oh, really? Um, oh. Or the uh, Where is it? You're, you're close to the I don't want to have... Are they on the Diligence website? Yeah, so if you go to um, diligence.consistent.net or meetfax.io, which is the name of the suite of tools that, uh, that uh, have come out of Diligence, right? There's also like a symbolic engine tool, uh, a static analysis tool, and a fuzzer. They both, they all work in tandem, just like they do in the Trail of ecosystem, but it's basically the same thing. They're both good symbolic engines, um, so you should use them yeah, whenever I, you know, I didn't know that the uh, little just had a happy... Yeah, uh, Mif Mifex is easier to use. So for people that are just starting developing smart contracts, if you are using like any tool at all, I think you should be using Mifex, but you know, I'm like... And Dean is also working on that, so... <coughs> Plugins for Mithril is also about the same as writing plugins for Manticore. They're both Python, they both use like C3 and everything. Thanks. If you have more questions, you can ask Steve. Yeah, yeah. I and I guess, I don't know if uh, other tool does it, but one of the things that Mithril is that it scans live, so actually it will help you like if some new vulnerability is identified and, and added to the SWF. Uh, this, yeah. Uh, they will let you know. What does it, what is it uh, use on the on the upstream? Like, where, where does it check for the new vulnerabilities that have been found? There's a registry of all of that that exists, so they check about that. If a new thing makes it to that list, they add it, and then you, you, you'll go directly to that. All right. All right. And they use also like a you to be able to scan what's already in the main and all okay, of you search SWC GitHub, the repo that holds all of the uh, identified uh, vulnerabilities should pop up in Google. All right. Another important thing, and I, I, I usually run into this, that you know, you need to make your code or try to keep your code as simple as possible. And uh, usually, for example, it's, it's good to start with baby steps in a lot of things. For example, there is uh, this was uh, this person that we're trying to get. It was more of a permission. But well, in New York, real estate is a big thing, and, and there's a lot of permission and documents that go back and forth a lot of, between a lot of different parties. So they were trying to say, oh, let's use blockchain for this. It makes perfect sense, and it kind of it does. However, basically what we said is like, yeah, but don't start with trying to get the whole workflow on the smart contract or everything on the blockchain because, you know, 
it changes, it, it change a lot. You can change on, on something. So right now, start just by you know figuring out a way how to stamp or how to make sure that someone could verify that the document is valid and nobody has changed it. But you know, don't try to get the workflow yet until you really get the tested and you know that it works and you know that it's not going to change because if you want to get, you know, government on board, you really want to, you don't know what they're going to request to you in advance. So first, have it running, get it there, and then, you know, figure it out what becomes actually transactional and repetitive that doesn't change and then try to go, try to go from there. So it's important that, uh, that you also take those uh, into account. Important thing is, uh, as you guys know, a lot of the things we do is import contracts or use contracts that are exist that exist out there, and they're they're safe. There are some that are safe, and you can trust because uh, there's uh, the, the people that are behind them. However, not necessarily everything out there is safe. So it's very important that if you're working with an external contract, you really pay attention to it, uh, and you really understand what it does and how it. How it uh, you know, all the dependencies and other contracts that you use, especially, you know, sometimes you import one contract and it imports, imports a lot, that imports on everything. So you really have to check everything that it, it's related to your contract because you never know if there's something that not necessarily is, a, you know, with a bad intention, but, you know, maybe there's some vulnerability to some other contract that, you know, they, that person was just not really uh, that diligent with it. And, um, and just, you know, forgot to check something or to change something or just did a very some common mistake. So it's very important that you take into account that. Yes? Or the compiler could be different at the time. Exactly. It's, I think it's, yeah, I think, I think later we also mentioned that. And the compiler, you know, it changes and everything, especially because, you know, I mean, Solidity is still on, on where well, there's no one yet, right? So it's, it's, it's important that uh, you take into account everything there. And, um, <coughs> So now let's get a little bit more about those recommendations about the code and a few things. So some codes that we're going to see, on, you know, like basic mistakes that uh, people made is, you know, how it ex ex executed. There's, there's, it's important in the order of how things happen. So the last thing that you wanna that you wanna do in the code is to send money. You first need to make all the chain. All first, check all the conditions. It's very important that you first check conditions so that you know that everything's correct, that's you know normal programming. Then affect all the state variables that need to be changed. Because, and this is what we're gonna see, reentrancy attack happens when you know I first send you the money and then I change your balance. In that in that small period of time, a fallback function kicks in and you know gets all the all the all the hacking. And uh, so it's very important that you always try to remember prior to prior, to live to, to to do everything that implies an external thing of your contract for the last everything that is internal to your contract should happen first and it's very important that you you, you always make that uh, you know your everyday uh, better brought your everyday uh, you know like don't forget to do that that's what I'm trying to say. Then you also see another interesting thing is that if you have a fallback function that you check that you know whatever it's coming in when they when it's called that it doesn't have any strange data on it. So you could add that uh, small require there just to make sure that you know there's nothing strange coming in to your contract um, for the fallback. Um, important as uh, that of there was mentioned, you know. Changes happen in Solidity very often, like new words get deprecated, and you, so as, it's impossible to know exactly what will happen in the future, but as much as you can, try to work with the most uh, reliable and up-to-date version of everything, because they're introducing uh, changes quite often, but those changes are really uh, important. And as much as possible, try to always work with the most latest and most stable version of whatever is out there, especially with, uh, with the code. And just like uh, he was saying, it's very important that you fix the compiler to a specific version. Even if you could put like anything from here and above, usually that will work. But it's better if you fix it and you leave it fixed so that you never get the chance that some word is deprecated or something could be done in a different way. Because you never know, every time you fix something, you broke something somewhere else. So you never know what, will, what other backdoor will be open when we close one. So it's very important that you always, at least as much as possible, try to know what you're facing and, and the potential challenges that you might be running into. So 
So we're just gonna explain a little bit based on that, like the reentrancy attack. I know that this, I don't, let me see how well can people see this. But let's just, I'm just gonna quickly show two, two, smart, two simple smart contracts, just to show like the malicious and the vulnerable contract. There's, there's nothing really complicated here. For those of who are also new, I don't think you're gonna have any issues on understanding it. But basically this is just a contract that just gets money and you know it will give you back uh, one ether at a time. That's that's all it does. That's nothing. There's just two functions. Well, that's basically the deposit that it will just get money, one ether or more. Yes. Yeah. Good idea. Thank you. just get one ether or more that's it not nothing else just just for the purpose of the exercise there's the function that takes the money out and this is what we're saying the issue that we have here is that you're first kind of ascending the money and then you're affecting the the, the, the variable the state so my balance is like oh okay I'm gonna give you five so I first give you five and then I go and write it down on the on the ledger so that's that that's the issue that basically this contract has and then you just have you know a function just to get balance so that's what you know the the, the vulnerable contract has. This is a reentrancy attack. You know? Then the malicious, the malicious contract, honestly, the only thing I'm having is, as probably you all know, or most of you probably know, you, you can inherit as an object oriented programming language. So basically all I'm saying is just I'm just creating the I'm just inheriting everything from the contract and I'm just passing it the address of the contract that I want to attack. Because I have that public address and you know you can import it there. It really depends on how you do it. There. And then you just have everything. And the important thing here, let me see where it is. If you see, I have a fallback function. And the fallback function is just checking if the contract has money, has one, <coughs> one, one ether or more. That's, that's, and if it does, it just asks, it calls the function withdraw again. That's what the fallback function is, is doing here. Right? Rather than being just an empty thing, where you're just, you know, just have it there just in case for whatever, something comes in or something. No, I have actually uh, a, a piece of code that will run when this function is called, right? And basically the structure is similar, you just have it there. So, because the internet connection was um, a little bit bad, I just don't want to take it any risks. So here's basically, uh, this is the code of, the same code, I'm not really gonna make it that big because honestly you've seen the code, is, trust me, it's the same thing. And so, basically I have the two contracts deployed, right? Everybody knows Remix here? I figured, yes. Okay. I know there's some people that are new. So basically all I'm gonna do is like, let's say this poor guy over here is gonna deposit 10 ETH here, right? So I deposit to the vulnerable contract. Right? So if we get the balance, positive, yeah. Got it. Get balance. Alright, oh yeah, I already it. Uh, I don't know if it can be made bigger, but it's, it has 10. 10.99. Uh, that's, that, that's what it has. Right? If, you get, if I get check the balance of the malicious contract, it just has 22. So the only thing that right now, if I, if I just want to, to get it out, I just, I, I need it the first with, with the contract. The first thing that I needed to do is that I need to get this malicious contract in the mapping, in the in the contract that I want to attack. Right? So the first transaction that actually happened is was this contract deposited one ETH in the vulnerable contract, so that it is in the in the mapping of people that could withdraw money. Because if you read the code, you can see that you know if you're there, you're able to withdraw money. That's the only thing that the, the previous step that happened there. Right. So now. The only thing I, I, I have to do, I know that this is the attacker's address. I'm just gonna hit uh, withdraw. And if you see, it takes some time because it's just, it's, got, it's just running. And if we just check this balance here, you see now it doesn't have 10. You just have the 99, 99999 because I took all the 10 E out. If I just check this contract here, you, you see it doesn't have 22. We have 32. But the code says only to take one and then 
get the money. Why? Because what is happening is that at the time that they send me the money in the in the in the malicious contract, the fallback function kicks in. So it calls the function again. So the function sends another money, calls the function again, and it just stays there until the condition is, is out, which is when you don't have one e. That's why it's, there's nine uh, nine ninety nine uh, there. So that's the reentrancy attack, and something similar to this is what happened with the DAO. And, uh, and it's, it's something that is not really hard to avoid. It's just, as we were explaining before, it's just a matter of how you affect everything. So whatever you're doing externally to your contract should always be the last thing that the function should do. No? After any assert there. So basically, before any effort, therefore, basically that's, that's there. Um, another kind of a common attack, uh, how many of you are, are familiar with the TX origin attack? Okay, I see this hand, so I'm gonna go into more into it. Um, basically, there's, um, how many of you are familiar with the msg.sender uh, instruction or keyword or term? Okay, move. So MSG sender basically just gives you the address of whoever is giving, is interacting with your contract. So whoever sends a transaction, whether, whether that's a contract or a person, uh, you get that. So as you guys know, what happens a lot in the space is that you actually have some person that sends something to a contract and that contract may call someone. So if for whatever reason, the third contract or the second contract in this equation wants to know because you are gonna send money and you don't wanna send it back to the, to the first contract, you wanna send it directly to the user, Right to avoid gas and a lot of potential reasons for that, um, you use TX origin so you know who, which is the address that started the whole transaction itself. Right, so that is handy in that case. So you, if you're being a withdrawal like taking money out, it would be handy so you don't have to pay for whatever reason anyone who's in the middle, right, or, or like or have a lot of transactions happening for everything that is in the middle. However. It, it also could work to impersonate someone. And what happens is that, let's say, uh, what's your name? Felipe. 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 So let's say I, I want to, to, to impersonate him. So what I would figure out, and let's say that your name is? JC. JC. So the, co the contract he wants to really interact with is JC's. So what happens is that I figured out a way to trick him to think that I am JC's contract. I don't know, I put, you know, I do phishing, I put whatever, it looks like it, or something, and he thinks it's his wallet, or, you know, exchange, or whatever thing, I don't know. I just figured out a way to trick him, uh, to trick him. So, he will send a transaction to me, and what I will do is then, then I will send it to uh, JC, right? Yeah. But, you, but because he uses TX origin, then he's gonna think that it's actually him who's getting the money. For whatever reason, depending on how the code is, I would be able to perhaps do something that I'm not supposed to do. Maybe not necessarily steal funds, because still, he's just gonna refund the, 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 the TX origin address, but I might be able to break something, or to maybe get in, in the fallback function, or, or do something there that, you know, I don't want, that uh, JC is not really accounting for. You know, that's, that's the hard thing here where your code is public, is that people could be really clever and figure it out how to attack it. You know, so that's why it's important to make it simple, and that's, so that's a little bit about the, the TX origin. So I'm not saying not to use it, but you have to be careful uh, for what you use it so, you, so that you are not really opening the door for someone to, if they manage to make this trick, to you to do to try to do something uh, to your code or to take advantage of anything that is in, in your contract. And um, so, I, oh sorry. so another thing that could happen is, is similar, which is kind of a denial of service kind of a thing. I don't know if that's the best name of it. But, but uh, basically, what happens is that similar. Let's say, uh, this is an example of, let's say I have a magazine and you subscribe to it. And you know, you'll pay me monthly or for whatever reason, you, you pay me on, on a recurring basis. But I also have in, in my function that refund fees for something, I'll refund everybody. You know, I'm shutting it down, I'm refunding everybody because I'm changing the code to a new code. So I'll, People just, for them to be happy, I'll just give them back the money and they just resubscribe if they want to because I'm gonna change the smart contract and have a new one. I don't know, whatever, you know, you can figure it out what we said for, for, sometimes in these cases it's like really hard to find a specific one. But let's say that I have a function 
where I look through the array of all my, the people that has been subscribed, and to refund everyone. So basically what I could do here is that I could get, rather than someone's, like an externally owned account address there, I could get a contract. And what happens is that when this person is like, okay, I'll give you back your fee, and I pop your address out, what I actually do is that here I have a fallback and just get it there. So that, this, this function never finishes because I just keep, keep it trapped. I'm not earning money out of it. I'm not really, do, I'm, the only thing I'm doing this is just to br break your system. There's not necessarily get any, any economical gain for me, but I just find a way to break your system. And the thing that happens is basically that. So because it will not happen, or I could put a, a condition, for example, like uh, one equals zero. That's false. It will always be false. Require one equals zero. That's always false. So it's going to turn back, give back an error. So the state is going to revert. So you're never going to be able to pop my address out of the array, and you're never going to be able to loop through the entire array. I didn't get any money. I didn't got anything out of it. Just you know, maybe cause you a lot of pain with your users, right? Because of course, if you don't have any other functions, any other way to refund the users, you're not gonna be able to refund them, right? So this is why I would say it's very important that you, you, you have to think about all the things that, that could go wrong. And again, it's as simple as first take that address out, affect everything internally in your contract, then do whatever you do in externally. You know, that could, you know, not necessarily solve everything, but probably will help you a lot. So, how do you face this vulnerability? Like I said, there's the SWC directory list, which you know there you could go. It's very, it's very. Uh, it's you have examples of code there. You have examples of solutions there. So I definitely some, a resource that you should check and that you should you know pay a visit every now and then because it's updated. But there's also called design patterns. There's things that you know people try to put in place so that you kind of a, if you implement those in your code, you're I'm not gonna say you're bulletproof, but at least you know that you're prepared to face some of the most common things that until somebody more much much more smarter comes in and finds another uh, backdoor, you're gonna be able to at least protect yourself better. So I'm just not I'm not gonna go through all of them. This is quite simple and even if. You know, so you, for you might be obvious. We have it in this slide for a reason. It's very important that you try to take advantage of the modifiers and, and have permissioning to what who could do what. Because uh, if not, if you just have it public or if you have it, uh, or you didn't put private or you don't have anything, you know, anyone could execute something. And uh, again, sometimes people forget how different it is to work on, for you guys, probably name, like second nature now. But for other developers that are more used to on-premises or all the kind of things, it's 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 a shift in their mindset. So it's very important that you always also forget, don't forget about these kind of things. So use the, uh, take advantage of the modifiers to use them as who has permission to do what on your contract. Then, uh, kind of what we're saying, it's very important that um, you know you do you do. Who can explain the difference between require and assert for conditions? When to use one? Yes about spending all the gas or not. One difference is that assert will burn or will take all the gas that you have there, require will give you back, in case of failure, will give you back uh, the remaining <coughs> gas. Yeah, that's that's yeah. one, that's true, yes. Assert should never occur at runtime. time. Yeah. That's true. So usually you first <coughs> use require and you leave assert for the last piece of it. Okay, so this, usually that's an important ordering that you have for how it happens. Like whatever is really extreme or everything should that, you know, it's the one percent <laughs> thing that might happen that could break or something more than you can even uh, 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 I'll add to that, like what, the, the, the reason for you to use assert is to assert invariants, right? Things that you never want to happen, right? So like if you, let's say if you don't want the balance of your smart contract to ever be one, the way you designed it, it should never be below one ether, right? Um, the, the, the way a certain is implemented in Solidity is that it actually uses a different opcode, right? An invalid opcode, as opposed to the, to the, to the opcode that the revert instruction compiles down to. Now, what this allows is that when you use like formal verification tools, be it like the, 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 from, from consensus diligence or from the trail of bits, 
you should use the consensus diligence one, but all of them work the same way. You can use the assert condition uh, for those tools to be able to see if anything is violated in your smart contract, right? I, I do think that the Solidity team like also has the SMT checker updated right now uh, to be able to uh, auto-generate these, these assertion violations uh, based on your code alone. But yeah, you can add these yourself and then run the tools and make sure that none of these assertions are violated with the help of like an automated tool. Yeah. For example, I know that uh, some of the people that have made ICOs or something like uh, when something something could be hacked or something, they had like a search like if the transaction is over 10% of the volume, stop it. So well, what's the benefit of burning the gas for a search? Or is it is it due to the extremity of it? You want to uh, decide <coughs> that kind of action or punish that kind uh, of action? I would say so it's not cheap. But uh, they have got a better there, there, so, so, so there, there may be like a game theory, game theory or an incentive behind it, but I'd say that the way they're used today, mostly is that they should never be triggered. So like, that's why revert is better, right? Like in the beginning, back in the day, the, 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 the op code that actually returns the remaining gas to the user didn't exist, right? To the, to the guy who paid for the, for the transaction. Um, that didn't exist, so this is all you have. When the, 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 the revert op code uh, came into existence, it doesn't make much sense to use this unless you want to. And these are, again, these are meant to be invariants. Stuff that will not happen ever by specification. So you're basically specifying your code. You're basically translating intent into solidity, basically, right? So like you're saying, this should never happen. And if it does, I want everything to stop. And that's when those automated tool, the tools that I said help you uh, verify that your assumptions were wrong in that. So I'm sure we do want to assert like, uh, there, is only, there should be this remaining account balance, and it should be above this limit, yeah. whatever. I know that, like I said, in some ICO contracts, my contract, some of the changes they did to the IC20 was that if there were two transactions that were like above 5% of the total token uh, supply or a few things, like very strange things that should not happen in a legal, normal cases, to have that stopped. So, so one, exa one good example of this is maybe more confusing than it is not. I don't know, like, you tell me, but like one good example of like the revert versus a certain um, Discussion is safe map by OpenZap. Do you guys know what safe map is? The library that actually checks that there are that overflows and underflows and whatnot do not happen, right? It's a safe way to do math. Um, it, it, it basically it was implemented with the certs. And what this man in OpenZeppelin's head was that if it's an assert, it should never happen. So your code should already make sure that overflows do not happen. However, people were not using it that way. People were using it to protect themselves from overflows. And it's the intent, right? So opens up in rewrote safe path to use refer uh, as opposed to assert, because now it's a safeguard. Now it's supposed to be to protect you at runtime as opposed to never happen, right? Yeah. I don't know if this is confusing or not, but uh, I'm happy to talk to you later when this answer about it. I just want to say, you talked a lot about why you'd use one or the other, but it sounds like the only actual technical difference between the two, one of them in terms of gas, the other one doesn't. It sounds like that's the only actual difference in terms of what it does, is that correct? Yeah, that's the only actual difference. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is there any uh, gas difference in that? Like, is there any size and outcome difference? Uh, no, I don't believe so. Uh, they, they all stop execution, so they have no problem. Yeah. So, more statements are used. Uh, Require code. statements used to refer to code. So, like, they actually return gas. Uh, so, the how you put in, like, a message. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you could do oh, that as well. Like, yes. Yeah, so in, in this yeah. case, where there's, it's not existing, but yeah, you could put, like, a not something, whatever condition. Do you just want to know and just put it out there? Yeah, this might be like earlier code and in the beginning to require a statements didn't even allow you to put messages and now they both use the referred out code and they still emit an event before stopping execution so that it's you're notified. But it's important that I mean that you always try to make sure either with require with if statements or assert depending on you know kind of a thing, that you always check for behavior. 
of your contract, you always test that because I think at, at the end that's the most important thing that uh, your contract behaves as you expect that it will behave. Um, then, well, like I was said, basically this is just all the tag effects interaction, which is just you know everything internal, then external, and basically you know update every uh, requirements, state variables, and then whatever goes external, so payments and all that. That's <coughs> that will save you a lot of trouble, and it's very simple to actually remember. So don't forget to to have those. Um, then there's also times where you may want your contract to stop running, right? Like for example, like I was saying, you know, these guys from the ICO, they figured out that you know they're being hacked. They managed to stop the transaction, but you know, they never know if something else will come and say, no, I want to stop. I want my contract for a time to stop, right? So you could have those and they're not that difficult, just you know, a Boolean thing, variable basically that only specific person with the, with the, with the uh, permissioning to do it will, will open or close that door and have it there so that you just make sure that you could have a, a, a this emergency stop. In case something happened, you're, you know, you're, you're finding out that, oh, somebody's figuring out a way to take money out, you know, not, not ha it's happening right now, as I see the money going down, I want to stop this or something, right? So it's very important that, that you consider all those kinds of things. And like I've said, this is just like thinking from the beginning. It's like, do I want this? Do I don't want it? You know, it's, it's very important that you stop to think what your contract, what features you want to have in your contract because once it's out there, you know, it's pretty, it's not that simple to make changes to it. And sorry, do you then add in like the is stop uh, flag throughout your code? Like, do you, do you check against that or? Like, uh, yeah, actually? basically, I cannot turn this and, but basically if you see uh, at the end, it's like emergency withdrawal, or in this specific case, what you just have is like, yeah, your contract has to be stopped and for whatever reason, like somebody's taking the money out, it's not safe, so you tell like, hey, it's not safe, I need to take the money out, I'm, I'm allowed to that because you were in the term seven. So it stop, you stop it and then you take all the funds out, you know? So yes, you put it there and under the circumstances that you stopped it, you, you check that that variable is stopped. Yeah. Or like, if it is before any payments, you may want to check that it is. It really, whether you do it or not, it will depend on, you know, how critical it is or how important it is. But you could always have flags that could allow you to, to stop something or even to put timers on things. In, in here is a stop, go, no go, but you could also have a timer, for example, so that something doesn't happen. You know, 5% of, you cannot, you cannot withdraw over 5% if not in 24 hours, kind of a thing. You know, for example, you could have something there for that. And you usually have like a modifier, like not stop, that you can throw in front of functions that you want to make sure that. I only call this function if it's not stopped. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it usually opens up, it has like very standard uh, libraries to do this or just contracts so you can in there uh, from their framework. <laughs> I'm talking a lot about opens up, and I don't know if you guys know, but. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, if you search for open Zeppelin in Google, like they, they have a bunch of stuff, including the, their framework, which like is not, they have an OS and they have like the, the normal like Solidity framework that just has a lot of reusable components that you can just like plug in. Like. Um, then, you know, like all oh, of variable contracts and all those kind of things, basically what you have there is just you have proxy contract that is the only thing is just being connecting you between uh, data and the logic of the contract sometimes. So for in this example, for basically what you just have here is that you know you have what's called the address of the latest version of the contract that you want to use for whatever thing that you're running or for whatever process is there that you want to have. And basically this contract, the only thing that it does is just holding the data, right? And um, so basically if you needed to change because the lo you changed the logic of a contract, you deployed a new version of a contract, let's say in that new version you added the stop, for example, right? For whatever reason. So you would come here, you would update the, the you'll tell it now, whatever thing that happens, you have to interact with this new contract that I deployed. So you kind of give him the new address to point to. Rather it's like, I was working with this contract, now you tell him now to work with this other contract. So that contract that for whatever reason you no longer want to use, you know, you could disable it, you could self-destruct it, or you could just leave it there, whatever you want to do. But now, the important thing, and this is kind of a way also that you can kind of a split a little bit of the, like the data and the, maybe the logic, the business logic of your application, and have, and, and, and have that, right? So it's called 
the, the same time as well, internal storage, in case you want to go into deep, deeper into that, because honestly, it has a lot of more things, but just to make it readable, we kind of like showed it a little bit. Uh, another, and this is more about like uh, rather than recommendation and things, is like you guys know, like I was saying, that storage is important, uh, everything is uh, by 32 word and all that. So even if it doesn't seem like a big difference or like something that you would say, like reordering, how do you order your uh, your state variables matter? Because if you're able to pack them in 32s, in back of 32s and everything, you make a more optimal use of space and it actually reduces gas consumption. So another, com another recommendation there is, uh, you know, when you have your state variables and you have everything there, you know, if for whatever reason you figured out a way how to better arrange them, it could be important depending on, on a lot of the circumstances of what your smart contract does or what you're doing, if it's a contract factory or different things out there. Uh, it could be a, it could be a, a good optimization to consider. So, you, so the optimal is to pack that variable into like little blocks of 32 bits? Yeah, for example, here if you say you have a, a, a one of 16, 16, 32, and 16, what will happen is that, correct me if I'm wrong, Salo, is that basically you're not gonna, there's gonna be empty spaces in the middle because the word is 32. So it's 32, it needs 16. Now I need to put 32. Oh, I don't have space, so I use another, I use another space in the stack. Oh, now I got 16. So there's gonna be empty spaces. So if you put 16, 16, they're gonna be better packed. Yeah. Well, this may look dumb, but the way the Solidity uh, compiler works is by reading from top to bottom. Like whatever, whatever happens, you'll always read stuff from top to bottom. And, and the reason why it is so, so, so this this way it would read 16 bytes and it would attribute it to a storage slot. And the, the way it works this way is exactly because there are storage slots that, that get used, right? So this would be storage slot number zero. And now it tries to write to a second slot because obviously if each slot is 32 bytes, these 32 bytes won't fit in the first slot. Now if you do it like this, the Solidity compiler will put this in the first part of the 32 bytes in the in the zeros slot, right? And then it still has like another 16 bytes addressable bytes, and then it takes these and just like puts them in front of the A. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I was thinking this. I think the C compiler actually does like actual C does uh, like packing optimization, and then you. <coughs> Like what do you mean? Yeah, this is this it packs it up. So like actually like <coughs> solidity has like everything is thirty-two bytes. So yeah, but exactly that's it does that for you. If you put this in C you'll kind of uh arrange it. Is there any plan to for the Sol C compiler thing that that? Sure. The reason it, it, this, is, this gets complicated fast. Like, not complicated, but like <coughs> this gets tricky fast. And the reason why is that so is because of the solidity has inheritance, right? And each of these slots, uh, they are shared in between contracts. So, like, if Solidity, if there are not, like, if there isn't like a clear ruling, a, a clear rule as to how Solidity does that type backing, and then right now is from top to bottom, maybe like a better solution could could be discussed. Even though, like, it's it's just uh, a a a spec to do this, right? Like, like you can do it a million ways, but like this is. This is how it does, and like if you inherit from this contract, the layout storage at, at the inherited contract will be exactly the same, right? So like if Solidity like just like yeah. randomly uh, uh, packed stuff in different places when you inherit this from another contract or when you access storage like uh, for any reason, you wouldn't be able to map it to where these different variables are, I guess. But yeah, this we can also talk about this over beers, and I'm interested in yeah. that idea. What's the difference between transaction cost and execution cost? Um, <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong. But basically, the transaction is, for example, like sending one ETH is 21. That's the cost of the transaction. Uh, but it's not, the gas cost is far more than one to send. So, so, this, so what is it? Yeah, so, so like transaction cost, like at least an added like 21,000 gas. Uh, because like that's the main contender. This this might I don't know this this I don't know if this was me writing it even. This might be wrong in the sense that uh, this may be what I I may have written this and, and what I meant here it was that uh, uh, by execution I mean like when it has been executed at least once first. I don't know. Deployment cost versus 
Yeah, but it doesn't uh, it doesn't make much sense to talk about execution costs if you're just yeah. deploying. 